Hi, um, this is a recording of a talk I gave at Epidemics Conference last week uh, in late November 2023. So I was invited to this uh, conference to give a plenary talk and uh, this filled me with excitement but also re-emphasized uh, my imposter syndrome. And so I started digging into those feelings uh, and also digging into data about why I might uh, feel like that. And I decided this was a topic worthwhile speaking about. So the title of my talk was SIR, Sir or Madam, and really wanted to I wanted to cover aspects around the impact of privilege on careers in epidemic modeling. So. As I said, to try and understand a bit more this uh, imposter syndrome I was feeling, I started to look into who had been previous plenary speakers at epidemics conferences. And I found perhaps unsurprisingly that most of them had been men. So here you can see um, for the nine iterations of the epidemics conferences, the gender balance uh, with uh, orange indicating men. Most speakers had been white, uh, similar to me. And I should say, uh, I will use throughout the talk, the um, terminology advised by the UK government um, of ethnicity and talking about white individuals and ethnic minority individuals. So I'm white too, but most of the epidemics plenary speakers have been white. And finally, most have been uh, native English speakers. Um, uh, or at least the plenary speakers have appeared to me to be men, to be white and to be native English speakers. And when you cross some of those uh, uh, aspects, uh, you find that there is even um, less diversity. So in case you like fun facts, and I've got to thank Amy Wesolowski uh, for these statistics, um, Amongst all plenary speakers uh, at epidemics conferences, there have been as many people called Mark as people from ethnic minorities, or at least this was true up to epidemic six conference. So I thought I need to look further in time. And in fact, across all epidemics conferences ever, there have been more speakers called Mark or Mark than uh, ethnic minority women speaking in plenaries. And closer to uh, me, there have been more people called Mark, John or Brian giving plenaries at epidemics than non-native speaking uh, women like me. So diversity has been really quite poor, but it does seem to be getting better. And the question I wanted to ask is, is it likely to continue to get better? I think we really are at a turning point where epidemic modeling is maybe becoming more popular. It's definitely been recognized as having uh, played a key role during the pandemic. Um, and therefore, I think it might be attracting more talents than in the past. But at the same time, um, I wonder to what extent modeling uh, epidemics is really attractive still. Pay is definitely not keeping up with inflation, especially in the public sector. Um, you can see here data from the UK showing uh, the recent increase in prices uh, in brown. Um, and you can see that this increase has not been matched by um, private sector pay and definitely not by public sector pay. Um, data from the US, more specifically uh, in academia and looking at life sciences, shows a similar trend whereby um, the salaries uh, in academia circled in red here, you can see are below average uh, when you compare to uh, the average job and in particular compared to jobs in the industry or even in governments. In addition, I think uh, our community is still suffering from trauma um, after the pandemic. This uh, shows results of a survey that um, asked uh, scientists who were involved in uh, working on COVID-19 and had interactions with either media or social media, what had been the impact of those uh, interactions. And you can see the gray bar shows that only 30% of the respondents said they had not suffered any uh, negative impacts of such interactions, uh, meaning that 70% of them had. And you can see that 15% of the respondents had received death threats. Um, so I'm not sure how attractive that is. This word cloud here um, is adapted uh, from work conducted by the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, where they asked UK-based uh, infectious disease modelers who were involved in the real-time analysis of uh, the pandemic how they felt about the experience. And you can see overwhelmingly negative uh, comments. 
So this led me to think about what uh, this room, the audience of Epidemics uh, Conference, would look like in 10 years. And my hypothesis is that um, it's already a room full of highly privileged individuals uh, with little diversity, but that this would uh, be likely to be even more the case in 10 years because less privileged individuals would be more likely to quit. Um, and again, uh, diversity was likely to be even um, uh, more reduced than it is now unless we actively work to promote it. Why does it matter, you may ask? Because I think because of the weight of privilege, we're missing out on talent and on diversity. And diverse working groups have been demonstrated to be more productive, more creative and more innovative. So let's first start by defining privilege. There's been many definitions of this word, but I like this uh, definition by Peggy McIntosh, who's a feminist and activist, who defined it in an essay, which I recommend reading. Um, she defines privilege as an unearned advantage or an arbitrarily uh, awarded power. And she reflects on her own experiences, both of white privilege as a white person, but also of male privilege as perceived uh, by a female. She defines white privilege as an invisible wetness knapsack of special provisions, assurances, tools, maps, guides, code books, passports, visas, clothes, compass, emergency gear and blank checks, which I think says it all. And she also highlights how gender and ethnicity are only two aspects of privilege. Um, and privilege is indeed uh, really multifaceted. I like this visualization uh, of privilege in the academic wheel of privilege, where each axis around the circle represents one aspect of privilege, such as gender, sexuality or skin color. And then um, each uh, inner circle represents um, a level of privilege or lack thereof. So, for example, um, on the gender axis, uh, in the middle, most privileged are cisgender men. Cisgender meaning that uh, your gender matches your um, sex at birth. Um, and then cis, uh, cisgender women are a bit less privileged and trans, uh, intersex and non-binary people are on the outer uh, circle, i.e. less privileged. An exercise that has been proposed to explore um, the, these multiple aspects of privilege is called the privilege walk. Um, it's an exercise that's designed to raise awareness of various forms of privilege, to appreciate the diversity um, in an audience and to explore multiple aspects of uh, one's own privileges. Usually it's run physically and in a small group uh, where people are initially lined up and then they are asked questions about privilege um, and upon each question, individuals step forward if they are privileged with respect to that question or backwards if they're not privileged with respect to that question. And at the end, people look at where they stand in the room compared to other people and reflect on the experience. Obviously, I could not run uh, such an exercise with 800 people in the room at Epidemics Conference. Um, so what I did was uh, running a simplified virtual version of the privilege walk. Um, I did start by a few disclaimers, which were that I hadn't received any training to run this exercise, that I was going to ask personal questions, um, so uh, not forcing anyone to participate, um, and reassuring people that the answers would be fully anonymous. Um, I did mention that the data would be analysed and displayed on screen immediately after being collected as part of the, the talk, so in real time, and that the data would not be used for any further analysis uh, beyond this talk. Um, so since then, um, I have created a copy of the bespoke privilege walk uh, I designed for this talk, which you can find uh, on this link. Um, and I also uh, now have made the code I used to analyze the responses during uh, the, the plenary um, fully available online. So you can find the code uh, on the second link. This is the list of questions I asked. Um, first, does one or both of your parents or guardians have a university degree? For me, that's a yes. Both my parents were actually academics. Two, growing up, did your family have enough money that they did not have to decide between paying for housing and food or paying for education or extracurricular activities? Again, for me, um, that was a yes. Three, could you buy a new suit 
or outfit for a formal event or job interview without worrying about how you would afford it. Again, for me, that's a yes, although I'm not sure my PhD students would have said yes here. Four, are you a citizen of the country you live in? So here, that's a no for me. Does your native language and your accent roughly correspond with the language and accent of most people in positions of power in the country you live in? Again, that's a no for me. Can you go to a work event at any time without having to delegate caring responsibilities? Again, no for me. Are you able to move through the world without fear of sexual assault? I'll say yes, I'm quite old now. Do, you work do your work holidays sorry, coincide with religious holidays or festive events that you celebrate? Yes for me. Do you have a physical or mental illness or disability, visible or invisible? No. And have you ever been hesitant to speak by fear of not being taken seriously because of the way you look or the way you speak? Yes, absolutely for me. So we then calculated a score based on this um, with uh, larger scores indicating more privilege. Um, I personally was a six out of 10, so quite privileged, but not that much. Um, and then I had three questions uh, asking respondents what best describes their gender identity, their ethnicity, and their job level. And I'll now show you what the results were um, during uh, the live talk I gave. As promised during the talk, these are uh, not for use beyond um, this presentation, please. So I asked the question, how diverse were we? Uh, and showed that we were um, actually a very uh, uh, gender balanced audience with roughly uh, half of men and half of women. So here the uh, men are in orange colors and the women in purple. Um, but you can see very unbalanced ethnicity mix uh, with white people in the lighter colors and ethnic minorities in the darker colors. So a very white audience. I asked whether uh, this diversity varied by career stage. So on the left hand side in purple, you can see the proportion of females uh, amongst the entire audience. That's the big uh, diamond. And then uh, stratified by career stage from student on the left to academic tenured on the right. And you can see um, a slight trend uh, going downwards, meaning maybe um, there were fewer females amongst more uh, advanced career stages in the audience. On the right hand side, uh, this was looking at the proportion of individuals from ethnic minorities, again, uh, amongst the entire audience with the big diamond, and then from student all the way to academic tenured um, in uh, black circles. And again, there is a, a suggestion that maybe diversity, uh, ethnic diversity, is slightly lower amongst academic tenured individuals than in earlier career stages. We then looked at uh, privilege. So this is a graph where each dot corresponds to one respondent in the room and um, uh, privilege increases as you go up the graph. Um, so again, here I would have been a six. The colors are for gender, uh, females in purple and males in orange, and ethnicity is shown uh, with lighter or darker colors. And the shapes of the dots uh, corresponds to the career stage. And um, you can see here that, you know, we were a relatively privileged audience. Most of the dots are in the top part of this graph. Um, and you can start seeing some indication of uh, maybe privilege varying by gender and by ethnicity. So we looked further into this. Um, here, the left hand side graph summarizes the distribution of privilege uh, amongst the two genders and uh, by ethnicity. Again, purple is women, orange is men, and lighter co uh, colors are for white individuals. So you can see a very clear indication of higher privilege in men and in white individuals. On the right-hand side, this is again looking at the distribution of privilege, uh, but by career stage, this time from student on the left to academic tenured on the right-hand side. And you can see uh, only a little uh, indication that maybe again academic tenured were more privileged than all other career stages. So this was it for the real-time analysis of the data I collected during my talk, and I left the audience uh, to reflect on um, what did they learn through this exercise? I asked them whether they were surprised. Um, I asked them how it felt to be in a more or less privileged group. Um, 
And mostly I wanted us to remember that through this walk, we only explored some aspects of privilege. So I designed a list of 10 questions for this walk, uh, but traditional privilege walks include typically 25 to 30 questions. And even with that, you might not cover the entire um, uh, privilege wheel. So now I wanted to um, address a few aspects of academic privilege in a bit more detail. And this was gender, sexuality, skin color, caring duties and language. And I've shown here in red where I stand uh, on um, the privilege uh, uh, wheel with respect to those uh, five aspects. So you can see that I was moderately to highly privileged uh, with respect to all of these. So let's start with language. This study from earlier this year compared um, the time it takes for non-native English speakers and native English speakers, so non-native in, in yellow, sorry, and native in blue, how long it takes for those two types of individuals to perform everyday um, tasks um, from an academic's life. And they showed, um, for example, that it takes twice as much time for a non-native individual to read a paper compared to a native individual. Similarly, it takes twice as much time for a non-native speaker to prepare and practice a presentation like the one I'm giving now uh, compared to a native speaker. And a striking 50% of non-native English speakers um, said they often decide not to give an oral presentation at a conference. Beyond language, accent is also sometimes a privilege. Um, regional and non-native accents often affect the perception of an audience and they're often associated with negative stereotypes, in particular regarding technical competence. Um, the photo in the bottom right was actually taken at Epidemics Conference and you can see there was a panel suggesting that there could be live translation into um, five different languages. Um, however, I have actually never seen this uh, used in practice at a conference. Um, so, you know, it's a great idea, although it's limited to only five languages, but in practice, I don't think that's uh, used very often. So issues around language and accents actually affect individuals, you know, at conferences, but also really in meetings, um, in everyday life, in interviews, um, and all the way to the coffee room. What about gender privilege in academia? In the UK, 75% of uh, professors are men. And this is despite the fact that at undergraduate level, more than half of the undergraduates are women. You can see on the graph here in purple, the proportion of uh, women decreasing when you go from undergraduate level on the left hand side um, all the way to professor on the right hand side. And in the US, the picture is very similar. Uh, this is a paper uh, showing the proportion of women at different career stages post uh, counted in years post PhD. That's the x axis. And the, uh, the whole of academia is shown in blue and the different colors show different fields of research. But across all of the uh, fields in academia, you can see um, a striking decrease in the proportion of women as you get to more advanced career stages. So what does this mean for gender equality versus gender equity? Well, if you're aiming for equality, so a 50-50 split in committees, for example, this can incur a very high relative burden on each woman. And the audience for this talk, you know, is an audience of uh, epidemiologists, so they know how to make an odds calculation. But this is what just what I've done here. Um, and this shows that where you have only a quarter of women, for example, amongst professors in the UK, each one would need to do three times as much as each man if you wanted to have a 50-50 split in uh, committees. Um, I wanted to look at gender privilege uh, really closer to our community, so in epidemic modelling. So I looked at um, the uh, members of SPIM, which was a group of UK uh, scientists uh, and modellers who worked in real time to model the COVID-19 pandemic um, in the UK. And I was part of this group. And I found that almost two thirds of the members of SPIM were white men. You can see here again the gender and ethnicity split. And um, I wanted to 
see how this compares with the U the UK census because I had a, a good prior for what the uh, gender distribution should be, but not really the ethnicity, the ethnicity distribution. And this is um, what the UK census looks like. So you can see that uh, SPIM um, was maybe a little bit underrepresenting ethnic minorities in dark colors compared to the census. Um, but more strikingly, females um, or women were uh, much uh, underrepresented in SPIM compared to the UK population. Colleagues from the University of Georgetown also looked at uh, gender privilege uh, in epidemic modeling by looking at publications in our field. And they found that most publications in our field have a male first and last authors. And this is the uh, blue or purple area in this graph. Time is the x-axis, so you can see the proportion of man-man paper is slightly decreasing, but is still making up about half of all the papers in our field. And one can wonder if this is just because there are more men in our field, uh, but I'll show you in a minute that that's not the case. Uh, these colleagues also looked at uh, the citations of these papers and found that the men-men papers were more likely to be cited compared to an average paper, and uh, that in fact the papers where the first and last author pa uh, and sorry where the first and last authors are women in brown were much less likely to be cited than any other paper. Again, looking a bit closer to home, um, we analyze data from our own department on publications by researchers in our department and found that on average, each man publishes more and that this is true at all job levels from um, research associate to professor. And the table shows um, the estimated uh, relative number of publications for a man compared to a woman. Um, and you can see that this is uh, much uh, higher than one in all author positions. Again, here, this is an individual measure, so this is not explained by gender imbalance, in particular at senior levels. This is also not explained by maternity leave. Um, we calculated that women should have had around five years of publishing break to explain the observed discrepancy, and that this would be um, uh, amongst uh, an average of nine years of experience. So really, uh, n probably not the main explanatory reason. Currently, we're exploring other factors that may uh, influence this gender gap in publication, including a potential gender bias in other areas of work, for example, um, teaching. And we had a poster uh, presented at Epidemics that explored um, these issues in a bit more detail. Colleagues from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine also looked at this uh, gender issue uh, using more qualitative approaches. They performed uh, 28 interviews and three focus groups with current and former UK infectious disease modelers, um, including uh, uh, men. They discussed perceived career barriers, um, including some that were generic to academia, but also uh, some that were specific to infectious disease modeling. And those are the ones I'm going to talk about. And they found that these were actually exacerbated by COVID. So uh, participants said that our field was a highly competitive boys club where uh, one was expected to sacrifice um, non-work commitments, that there were pressures, for example, to engage in drink drinking in order to fit in and be provided with opportunities. There were also uh, a perceived hierarchy in backgrounds whereby individuals with a math or computing backgrounds um, often associated with um, male gender was perceived to be better than um, a background in say biology or public health uh, typically perceived uh, as more likely to be a female background. All um, respondents, including men, acknowledged that there was a disproportionate amount of invisible labor performed by women and non-binary people. And all these issues were perceived to be exacerbated by the low number of senior women in the field, um, such senior women being often thought to be repeating toxic patterns that they themselves experienced. What about ethnicity privilege in academia? Well. In terms of uh, ethnic diversity, this is very similar to gender, i.e. ethnic diversity decreases at advanced career stages. 
This graph shows data from the UK, and if you focus on the bottom set of bars, you can see how the proportion of white people uh, increases from undergraduate in red all the way to professor in blue. And at professor level, the proportion of white individuals actually exceeds what you'd expect from the census, which is the little black bar. Again, a very similar story in the US, where here, if you go from bottom to top, from assistant professor to full professor, you can see an increase in the proportion of white people um, shown in the dark uh, purple color. And again, at professor level, the proportion of white individuals exceeds what you'd expect from the US census. But what I found interesting was also that actually studying ethnicity privilege in academia in predominantly white countries was really hard because of the small numbers in each minority ethnic group, um, especially if you wanted to stratify by other factors. Um, in our own work on publications, um, we actually found uh, that white individuals were um, publishing more than others, actually quite a lot more with the median um, that was 11 papers higher for white individuals. But the ethnic diversity in our department was insufficient to fully explore this result, and in particular, to stratify by job level. Uh, we have job levels where there are simply only white uh, individuals. Sexuality privilege. So this is a map showing um, the state of the legal status of same-sex intercourse globally, where blue shows um, different levels of it being legal, and yellow all the way to red shows uh, different levels of it being illegal. So you can see here the unique challenges that LGBTQ plus scientists face when they travel international, internationally for work, especially in areas of the world that are particularly affected by infectious diseases um, and therefore particularly relevant for our field of research. They face risks to their safety, to their well-being and to their mental health. So a colleague from Imperial College, uh, Christina Atchison, performed a survey where she aimed to explore the perceptions and experiences of LGBTQ plus scientists at Imperial when they worked internationally and traveled overseas for work. She found that 61% of them felt uncomfortable, unsafe or in danger when traveling. Almost all of them considered uh, overseas travel as important for career progression, yet 39% had at some point chosen not to do overseas travel uh, based on their sexual orientation or gender identity. So you can start to see here mechanisms by which um, a lack of privilege might uh, bring uh, barriers to your career. Finally, I wanted to talk about caring responsibilities, privilege in academia. And before I start, I'd like to say I had, after my talk, discussions with people uh, who were in the audience who told me, you know, caring responsibilities is not a privilege because it's something you choose. Um, and I think this is a very privileged perspective. I think many people don't decide to be a carer um, in many countries, including high income countries in the world. You might have children without having decided to have children and you might be caring for relatives. Um, uh, that you haven't chosen to care for. So I think this is an important issue and goes way beyond childcare uh, for individuals who have decided to have kids and who have healthy kids. So I wanted to take the example of conferences to address this problem. Um, and for example, I found no support for carers at epidemics conferences. I looked uh, at whether there was support elsewhere and I found some, for example, at Imperial College, there is a care support uh, scheme that enables to provide finan financial support um, when a staff member uh, or a student travels uh, for work-related reasons. But I found that the scheme wasn't advertised very widely and that it was really hard to access in practice. So when in the past I have tried to access it, I was asked whether I have a grant to cover this. So although the scheme exists, there isn't a lot of funds uh, supporting it and you might have to actually provide your own funds. I also found the scheme exacerbates other aspects of marginalization, such as social privilege. Um, uh, indeed, the scheme by default does not provide advanced funding, meaning that you will need to pay upfront costs for uh, caring and uh, you'll only get the money back later. It also exacerbates dependency on senior academics um, 
because your manager has to determine if the event is relevant to your career. Um, and bear in mind, those senior academics are very likely to be highly privileged individuals who don't necessarily have caring responsibilities themselves. Finally, I think uh, this scheme leads to more invisible work. Um, for this specific um, uh, funding scheme, you need to provide evidence that no alternative source of funding is available. Um, good luck with that. And then, of course, you'll need to provide more receipts um, to demonstrate all the money you spent. I do think there is hope, though. Um, some conferences do offer support. In our field, for example, the IDD conference does, which is great, although it's not perfect. Uh, for example, it seems that it's only suitable uh, for those who are bringing the person to care for with them, which, again, works for a little baby, but maybe not for other types of caring. However, conferences are only a small part of a carer's work life and uh, really caring responsibilities affect everyday academic life in multiple ways that I've found really often exacerbate other forms of marginalization. And this leads me to talk about intersectionality uh, or the complex effect of overlapping facets of privilege. So if you um, uh, experience multiple privileges or multiple lacks of privilege, um, and so you're in one of the overlapping parts of that diagram on the right, um, what intersectional intersectionality means is that you might actually um, uh, face hurdles that are not just the sum of the hurdles that you would experience if you were only in one of those circles. And I think uh, this effect has been uh, greatly exacerbated by COVID. So I don't want to be all pessimistic, um, so let's talk about solutions. I think solutions will come from uh, many actors, um, uh, you know, playing a small part into a big problem. Um, and if you're an academic listening, uh, you'll be sympathetic with my attempt to uh, match um, my description or my talk to uh, the terrible acronym I chose for uh, the title of my talk. So the talk was entitled From SIR to Madam. So uh, Madam standing for Momentum, Awareness, Dissemination, Action and Mitigation. Momentum. I think there is a momentum and I think we should keep it. Uh, I've discussed a few initiatives that are trying to uh, raise awareness of those issues and, and solve them. And I'd like to give a shout out in particular to the newly formed LGBTQIA plus international support group at Imperial College London, who's doing amazing work. But I think there's scope for more larger and more coordinated efforts. Awareness. I think being aware of your privileges and those around you is really a very important step towards solving those issues. Um, hopefully the privilege walk I ran during my talk uh, helped individuals perceive better where they stand uh, in terms of privilege. And really I wanted to re-emphasize that, um, you know, the less privileged you are, the prouder you should be because um, if you've made it to listen to this talk and you are not very privileged, then you must be incredibly talented and you must have uh, given a huge amount of effort to get where you are. And if you are privileged, if you were in the top of uh, my privilege graph, um, you know, this is not uh, a talk to point my finger at you, but just to highlight that maybe you can leverage your privilege to help uh, less privileged individuals. Be aware of the hurdles less privileged individuals face and be aware of your biases. We all have biases. Um, knowing what they are is really important. Dissemination. This is critical to increase awareness, um, especially amongst privileged individuals and those uh, in power positions who can really help drive the change. So I'd really encourage everyone to uh, read and write about these problems, speak about them. And this is why I had decided to give uh, my plenary on this topic. Actions. So guided by awareness, we need to try and break this cycle whereby um, a group is a minority because they're a minority, but we aim for equality instead of equity, they often um, end up having really an overburden of invisible work. And because that work is invisible, they lack the recognition for it. Therefore, they lack the visibility. And because they're not visible, they can't inspire others uh, from that minority, which uh, therefore remains a minority. So how do we break that cycle? We need to empower minorities. Um, by supporting less privileged ones. Um, again, if you are yourself very privileged, use that to support the less privileged ones. 
Um, I really want to highlight um, a finding from multiple studies, including the qualitative study from London School I mentioned, um, which showed that formal and informal mentorship was really important. And I have definitely in my career benefited from incredible mentorship from individuals who typically were extremely privileged, but saw something in me uh, and helped me throughout my career. But also, I want to emphasize peer mentorship as being really important. Um, I, in the last few years, have engaged in peer mentorship with a group of other mid-career women um, in academic uh, epidemic modeling, and their support has been really invaluable um, to uh, support my career. And finally, uh, empowering uh, minorities has to also come from inside. So if you are uh, uh, from a minority, even if you're not very privileged, please apply for everything, even if you think you do not stand a chance. I think we need to design and adopt a work allocation model where we recognize varied professional contributions in a transparent way. And this has to go beyond just scientific publications. And we need to say, to state really clearly, what is each contribution worth? So if I teach 10 hours, how many uh, papers uh, is that worth? Or how many uh, committees I sit on is that worth? And we need to collect quantitative data to monitor equity better. And this has to include exit surveys so that we understand why individuals might be leaving the field. Finally, we need to actively showcase and perhaps even exaggerate diversity. So in conferences and committees, we obviously want to aim for diversity and seniority. It's so great to have um, a senior representative of a minority speak at a conference, but sometimes it's hard to get. And so I think when you don't manage to get that, please aim for diversity rather than seniority and invite someone from that same minority group who is less senior. If anything, you'll help them become more senior. Please refuse to speak on all white or all men panels. Um, and of course, recognize conferences and committees in your work allocation model um, to break this cycle. Finally, and I'm saying this because I attended a conference uh, earlier this year where um, really this was not the case, but if you have to put pictures of your team up, you know, either as a group or um, when you post individual pictures of individuals who did the work you're presenting, please uh, try to think about not re-emphasizing the old white men club paradigm that makes minorities feel like they don't belong. Finally, mitigation of biases and privileges we need to mitigate bias, whether conscious or unconscious, and there's existing and great training to do that. And at the individual level, we can, you know, when we screen CVs, for example, look for evidence of effort and talent and not evidence of opportunities and privilege. If someone has uh, given talks at 10 conferences, maybe this only reflects their privilege and not really their talent. Um, and I think, you know, we, we're epidemiologists, we spend our day uh, uh, correcting for biases in data. So let's do the same uh, when we think about privilege. We need to mitigate the lack of privilege and we can do this again with training. For example, we can uh, provide language support to those who need it. And we need to lift barriers um, associated with privilege, whether they're concrete barriers or self-imposed ones. So in, in terms of concrete barriers, I'm thinking, for example, of providing support for carers or for LGBTQ plus individuals who are traveling internationally. In terms of self-imposed barriers, well, we know, for example, that women are less likely uh, to put themselves forward. Um, and so we could, for example, make application to promotion mandatory on, or automatic to remove this um, self-imposed barrier. So in conclusion, privilege underpins career trajectories in addition to and beyond talent. And all data, no matter how we look at it, points to it. This is true, not just in other fields, here too. And actually in our field, it has been exacerbated by COVID. So we can't just ignore it. Uh, it needs open discussions and not just on the side. And it needs actions by all of us. It is a hard problem. I often uh, have people come to, to me to say, oh, it's so hard to have a balanced, um, you know, uh, gender balanced uh, committee or, or, um, or group uh, because women are more likely to say no. And yeah, I agree. It is hard. Um, other people have also told me, oh, we can't solve all of this at once. And I think that's true, too. But that's true of scientific research. It is hard and we can't solve it all at once. And still we tackle it. So let's tackle this one, too. 
Finally, I have attempted to give an overview of this issue, but this has been very much through my own experience, which includes a large UK and US focus, and without covering certain aspects, um, such as equitable partnerships in science, which is a related topic. But I hope this is just the start of the discussion, and based on what I heard um, uh, of discussions at the coffee uh, and and drinks at the conference, I'm uh, very pleased to see that maybe uh, my talk has generated more discussion. Final thoughts. Um, I really like this graph from a paper from Christoph Fraser and colleagues and uh, just had to use it. So um, for those of you who don't know it, have a look at the paper. Uh, but I think we can summarize what are the factors that make an infectious disease epidemiologist or modeler successful in terms of two axes. On the x-axis uh, would be increasing epidemiological talent or effort. And on the y-axis would be increasing privilege. And my point is that uh, the people we see as successful are uh, in our field are mostly in that top right corner, so the green people. And those are successful people who can really help nurture less privileged talent. And I think we could see more of the red um, uh, circle people um, who are also talented, but maybe just less privileged. Um, and an example I wanted to give uh, of someone incredibly talented, but may maybe not that privileged, is um, the Nobel laureate uh, in medicine uh, earlier this year, who I think has faced many hurdles during her career, and I'm very pleased she managed to overcome them. Um, so let's not lose uh, such talent in our own field. Um, this was just a, a description of all of the great science uh, that me and my team were presenting at Epidemics, uh, in case you didn't want to hear me uh, talk about uh, privilege, but wanted uh, to hear me talk about the science I do uh, on an everyday basis. And I'd like to renew my acknowledgements to everyone I've ever discussed this uh, problem with, uh, and in particular, my research group who's been really supportive, and also uh, Hans Hesterbeck, who was the one who invited me to give this uh, plenary and was uh, very nice in telling me that um, I didn't have to be very specific about the topic I was going to um, uh, tackle. Uh, he said in, in that email, I'm already happy. Um, and I think he was still happy after I gave the talk. So thank you so much, Hans, for giving me a platform uh, to talk about these issues. Um, these were my image credits. Thank you so much uh, if you have listened so far. And I have created two bonus slides in case um, you are still watching. The first one was my final uh, version of this, uh, of this graph where on the left hand side you can see I've added uh, armchair epidemiologists, so either leather armchair epidemiologists if they were very privileged and IKEA armchair epidemiologists if they were less privileged. Um, and finally, uh, something I had um, uh, uh, done before the talk but didn't have time to address in the talk, which I think is still quite funny, um, just to show that we are indeed a boys club and or chat GPT is biased, probably both. So I, uh, ahead of my talk, had asked chat GPT uh, uh, who are the 10 best infectious disease modelers in the world. And I asked this 10 different times to uh, adjust for kind of stochastic uh, variation. And you can see here um, the answer from chat GPT uh, across all 10 iterations, uh, with men shown in the kind of orange color, uh, women in the greenish colors, um, and uh, darker shades showing ethnic minorities and hashed showing non-native speakers. Um, so you can see again, uh, basically uh, what I would describe as a sea of native speaking white dudes. And this refers to uh, terminology used uh, in this fantastic book, Invisible Women, which I uh, read uh, this year as I was preparing for this talk uh, and which I definitely recommend reading. Thank you so much for your attention and have a good rest of the day.